So as I mentioned before we took our break, I've had a number of people over the past months come to me and talk about the challenges they're having in the Vancouver job market and, and with their careers. I think that we all know Vancouver is not the, the greatest job market. Right? I, I was born in London, and London has a much more vibrant job market. I've lived in Singapore, which most certainly has a much more vibrant job market. But we all know and love Vancouver, and, and many of us want to live and, and work here. And, and so we're in this sort of position where we like Vancouver, but we're having to deal with a job market which perhaps isn't the greatest. And so there's been quite a lot of discussion from people about well, what does it take to survive and thrive in, in the job market? <laughs> You'll throw Kevin out there, aren't you? Oh, he's <laughs> It's frozen. It's frozen. Oh. How'd you go? Go on, you're banished. You're banished. <laughs> um, so not only is Vancouver not a, not a wonderful job market, but as we also know, the demographics are changing, and the employment market is very much changing. My father and parents. Uh, no, it's okay. No, actually, you're actually fine. Then. Uh, my father uh, and, and my mother, you know, had essentially jobs for life, you know, they uh, were working in a very stable job market where you could lay plans and, and think ahead, or somebody didn't even have to think ahead because of the stability that was there. The job market's fundamentally changed, um, and today, you know, we're in a situation where you know, companies literally come and go. Hiring and firing has unfortunately become the norm, not the exception. And so workers and employees are you know, having to be a lot more adaptable than perhaps we have in, in the past. There is no guarantees anymore, there is no stability anymore. And so what does that mean for us going forward? Uh, I think today's job market is tough enough, but who knows what tomorrow holds either? You know, what are the trends that are going to affect the job market in the future. So for all of us, we're all mid-career. Okay, I'm getting past it. Yes. <laughs> I don't even really have to say yes quite so fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, you know, early to mid-career, most of you anyway, right? And, you know, you've got still got a long way ahead of you, and so it takes a lot of strategy. So what we decided to do was to have a little bit of a discussion about careers and, and, and jobs. And I've invited uh, two of our former graduates to join us uh, tonight to talk about their experiences. Now before I introduce them, I'm just going to show uh, for a, a show of hands on, on where we stand with Vancouver Job Market. How many of you have changed roles or employers in the last three years? Oh, Exactly. Right? How many of you feel very confident you'll have the same employee for the rest of your career? One. Two. Two. Government two. jobs. How many of you would like to change your current role? Wow. You know, um, it is, it's amazing, right? Um, and so that's why I wanted to discuss this. Now I'll introduce to you our grad panel. Uh, we have Heidi, Heidi Nicholas who is Director of Production with Wasman and Partners Advertising and is, is involved in some really interesting advertising projects, including SBC? Uh, SBC, Van City, Money Yeah, Force some really ABC. creative stuff and local yeah. stuff, which, which is really yeah. is great to see. Heidi did our Project Management part-time program. I can't believe this is back in 2009. I know. But <laughs> that scares me. <laughs> Heidi was one of my very first <coughs> students, actually. I never told you that, but you actually went away very first. Really? Yeah. And you were, we were, we did a, a thing, with a, a sort of a pilot with Rob, we were guinea pigs for his PMP. That's right. So when we put part. the PMP class together here for UEC, I did a little pilot with just a few students to, to it forced me to help prepare the material, and Heidi and Kevin right? uh, were a part of that. Uh, and then we have Sam who is with Play Now Lottery, who's a product manager. Um, so Sam is 2010, right? For the product yeah. manager, full-time intensive program. And has more recently done program management with 
this as well. Uh, now, the reason I invited these two guys down is because they're both doing really well. They're moving ahead in their career, and I think they can both be proud of their accomplishments. And so I wanted to use this as an opportunity to sort of pick their brains and facilitate discussion amongst yourselves. So I, as we go through some of the questions and answers, actually, I really would like you to participate as well. What are you experiencing in the job market and in your careers? What's working for you? What's not working for you? What are your frustrations? You can see how many of you want to move. That's just astounding how many people want to move. And so what are your experiences and what can we as a group do to help network and share those experiences and make Vancouver's tough job market a little bit more dynamic and workable? I've also invited David to join us here on the panel as well. Uh, David obviously uh, is an employer. Uh, running the businesses as he does, I thought that he could also provide a useful <coughs> platform to discuss you know, what does an employer look really, really want and what are they looking for. So I do encourage you to join, so feel free to ask questions. So I'm going to ask a few simple ones first. Okay, question one, and I'll start with Heidi. Um, you've both done well in your career, uh, and you've both been promoted and, and moved up recently. What do you think is it that has contributed most to the success you're now experiencing? Hi. What has contributed most to the mm -hmm. success? A lot of self-awareness. So, an intentional choice in what I wanted. So, when I took the, the PMP program, I thought back and forth and back and forth. Do I take it? Do I not take it? So, I did. And then I took, and then I went for my PMP. And then, I realized that I really became a lot more interested in sort of the management part of what I do and the leadership part, so I took the grad certificate in leadership at Royal Roads. And now I'm going through um, a coaching program. So it was, what moved me forward wasn't just, I need to take this, and then I'll get this, and then you take this, and I'll get that. It was really an intentional, what do I want, and what do I like? What do I really want? Kind of what's important about it, as opposed to just, well, I'm supposed to take this off the list or that off the list, and then, and then it'll just magically Kind of like to a lot of self awareness and then mm -hmm. seeing opportunities in within your career or, or mm -hmm. you know, within the company you work for. So they tune into the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for myself, it was um, one of the things that has driven my entire career and applied in personal life as well is just always looking to drive innovation within uh, my role, my life, um, always looking for ways that, uh, you know, whether it's I want to take on as a personal challenge. Uh, I always take courses almost every year just to tweak my skill set. Um, but also, look, the other thing is also looking within a company that you work for, looking for opportunities that um, for some pain points that they currently are experiencing and trying to be that solution for that company in uh, finding those pain points, uh, developing those pain points, developing skills to, you know, to lessen those pain points for the company. And I think that's one thing that, that's always driven me is to and find the in my career is just uh, um, developing myself as well as helping to develop the company. So you're saying you're proactive mm -hmm. yeah. in your career? Yes. Okay, on, on a scale of proactiveness, one <coughs> ten, 10 means really proactive versus one means I'm very, very passive about my career. How would you rate yourself that? Probably an 8. 8 out of 10. Or 9. Heidi? <coughs> 7 or 8. 7 or 8? David? 9. 9. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, that that's a common theme which I, I see in the other students who are really moving ahead, is they have taken ownership of this. Right? They're, it's easy to sort of give up and say, I'm a victim of Vancouver's job market. Uh, but I honestly believe that you've got to really take the bull by the horns and own it. And this brings me on to my next question, okay, which is about passion. And, and this was actually submitted to me by some of the younger students. Okay. Uh, we've been told to follow our passion. In today's job market, it's just not always possible, right? Um, do you agree with the advice to follow your passion? And if so, uh, how can you make it happen here in Vancouver? Can I start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I guess even going back 15 years, I think I can say that, you know, I was in a job that they really didn't like. That was like one of the worst feelings, I think, that I've ever had. And ever since then, I've always like followed my passion. And I don't feel like I've worked a day, and I 
I've been 15 years, I haven't worked a day. Uh, I feel like I've worked, you know, in on projects that I want to, that I choose and that I want or feel passionate about, or people that are passionate about those kind of projects. Um, and so I think it's just, uh, it can be done, is what I'm saying. Um, and then, I, you know, but it's, it's also introspective. You need to look at what, what drives you. And then, you know, find people that kind of have those same <coughs> values. Find a company that's those same type of values. And then um, kind of continue to, to, uh, to develop yourself and try again to um, continue to stay with that company. So you've been lucky then. That the, the opportunities that are out there match your passion. Yeah, I think when I'm knowing my company that I work for now, it's lucky something what you. Um, it's not. It doesn't just. Yeah. <laughs> it is kind of lucky, but I think you put yourself in a position to be lucky, though, right? Yeah. Um, I think you, 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 yeah. Put yourself in a position to be lucky by the choices you make, um, yeah. and the things you learn, and a lot of find those things that you learn. I, I, I agree. I think you can follow your passion, and I think. The sweet spot is like, where do the skills line up? So, you know, if you're thinking about changing careers, it's like, what do you want? Like, what do you really want? What are you, what are you good at? And what are the transferable skills? So, yeah, there is a dose of, of, of practicality or realism in it, but um, I think I think we can follow our passion. Um, if you want to be aligned with your values, what works for you, what you really want. Um, and again, of course, you have to think about your transferable skills. It's like, great, this is what I want. How am I going to get there? So what do I need to do? Because there's always ways. There is things you can do. Yeah. Um, so out of interest, how many of you would say you are following your passion? Everyone's heard this advice, right? How many of you? One, two, three. Okay, it's probably a third. Half. Yeah, that's reasonably good actually. But that obviously does mean there's a lot of you aren't, right? Which which makes it hard, right? Uh, and that leads me to a follow-up question. Okay. Uh, do you think you can develop a passion for something even if you didn't have that passion for the subject in the first place? Okay. So, yeah. Um, I think there's, in I think you can find things that you um, can can find. Like for instance, I'll use an example. Um, I'm driven by innovation, so. If I'm looking, if I'm working on a very dry process model, I always look to, for ways of how to be innovative within that process model, or this, this production pipeline, or you know, what drives me is creating new products. And so, um, even though to get to a new product, you have to do a lot of front work. So I think you just find you know, those things that you do like about the role, um, and then at the same time, you understand that you know you can always find things that you challenges, I guess you could say within those other types of things that you need to do to do to get to the you know, fun stuff. Like there are, so I think there is ways to find uh, those little tweaks within each of those um, areas. So, David, I'm guessing you have followed your passion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it's interesting to hear what, I go back, way back. <laughs> and uh, I came over from the UK here in 1969, and um, I got a job in the UEFA, if you really don't know what's going on here, it's just a new country and everything else. And, and being brought up in the culture of the UK as well, you know, as you were inclined to respect the chair, so you mm -hmm. don't say things that yep, you shouldn't say. So I remember there's a few hinge points in your life that are important to sort of reflect on. I remember that um, I was uh, working on a project. And I was uh, sitting in a boardroom with a lot of VPs and everything else, and this particular project had a challenge. <coughs> and I was sitting there listening, and listening, not saying anything. And then, being the youngest there, I just got frustrated and said, I think you're all wrong. And everybody looked at me and said, well, who is this guy who has got the audacity to even suggest that we're wrong? So the chairman of the, of the, of the point in time, he said, listen to the kid. I said, well, I think this is where I think this is what has happened here, and I think this is what you should do. And everybody said the kid's right. So what does that do? That gives you a sudden boost. You now believe you can make a contribution. And that is extremely important because the one thing that we find quite often is that you get an education. An education is a passport to a job. That's all it is. There's an expectation today with a lot of students that came out, that suddenly they're here, they've arrived, and you know, white homes just, just going to be roasted. It doesn't work that way. And I think the 
important thing, the other important thing I think is maybe just to reflect on, is that I was once told, and I think this is true, is what you should do is you have a vision of where you want to go. You have ability. You have to make sure that you don't get into a job that is beyond your ability. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll get smothered in everything else. It's like me going and working for NASA. I'd possibly be on the bottom run. But going and working, picking up garbage, I'd possibly do quite well. So one thing that is important is that you need to make sure that you balance your ability for your job. That's mm -hmm. important. And the next, well, the, the next key item is then, is once you've got established in that job, is to work yourself out of the job until there's nothing left. Then people recognize your ability and will promote you. That's important. Don't feel backward of coming forward because you have a responsibility within the company to make a contribution. You are part of a team. Therefore, you see things that are wrong or wrong or just not working right, you go and suggest methods to do it. Not in an aggressive way, but making a contribution. These are important to your literally survival. And that, that I think, is uh, no, I agree. You know. So you rocked the boat as a young age. Yeah. Did you guys rock the boat at all? Did you challenge conventional thinking? You didn't? Big days? Uh, yeah, uh, for innovation you definitely did. Yeah. Um, there's always change management with, um, with different people, people management, there's process changes, there's uh, always, I'm always dealing with, with conflict. Um, but I think it's uh, that, that healthy conflict because at the end of the day we're all trying to create great things. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, it's uh, to have a, a good, you know, what I always looked at is like having like I always don't ever deal with project managers. I'm I'm a project manager, but I'm also have project managers um, uh, working on the, my projects, and I always feel like I can step when I have a project manager, I can step back and be the creative um, design type person, and have that that real balance of um, you know always fighting for more scope, and then at the same time understanding as a project manager, I understand when to like okay minimal viable product is good enough, right? And so. Um, so I think it's just, you know, conflict is necessary. It, it creates, it builds the best um, teams, it builds the best product in the end. The one thing that you have to be careful of is that you don't become indispensable. If you want to grow, you have to, as I said, you have to work yourself out of the job and make sure that you are looking at how do you rise up and filter underneath you somebody that can take over. And that's one of the other fears, is that people are inclined to sometimes be scared to go and get help underneath because they think that the job is taken away from them. So growth, the only way you can go through this growth is to get layered organization behind you that works with you, respects you, you rise up, the job's nothing to work, and the company recognizes your ability and promotes you onto something else. That, to me, is important. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you get this fear that, you know, I'm the only one who can do this job, and I don't want anybody to stand in my way, then you'll never move. I think I think this is a trend I see actually that some people do they they have a job and they then go into defending the job yeah. right mm -hmm. versus the advice which is to actually work your way out of that job by developing other people underneath you. Do you see that to be true in your experiences as well? That's for example. Um, doing that right now. I'm I'm backfilling um, two people to two underneath me um, that will uh, take over the operations of what I'm working on. And um, looking forward to the next challenge after that, which is driving um, even more innovation within the company. Okay. Okay. And, and I, so what do you say? To uh, um, you know, some people sort of have a job and they try and sort of defend it. I, yes. I'm the guardian of this piece of knowledge, yeah. and I shall not share it with anybody else, lest they take my job away from me. Um, whereas David's advice is to actually take an opposite approach, where you're actually actively training your replacement. Yes. So that you yes. position yourself to better move ahead. So you're asking me, do I see this? Yeah. Or do, do I experience Yeah, does this exist in your organization too? Both exist. No. <laughs> the defensive part, and I think, and then the growth part. So <laughs> which strategy is best then? Oh, do you agree with David? definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. It's like that's the best thing for the corporate culture mm -hmm. that you have and for your career, anybody's mm -hmm. career. <coughs> I mean, I'd rather surround myself with people that are smarter than me and do things better than me. One, try to feel like I have to know everything and have that fear. Again, like you were saying, I would rather, to your point, sort of build yourself out of the job. At the same time, you're bringing everybody up with you. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've got to understand what we're looking at. There's a diverse you know, businesses here all over the map. So I mean, it's not, I'm, 
not talking about sort of the industrial side, but I'm sure that there's other interests here that go beyond the industrial side. But the motivation is basically still the same: is that that you really what you want to, what you want to do is to remember or bear in mind what is the what is the person that's employed you? What is he looking What is he looking for in terms of growing his business? And you play into that. Right? So, for example, if he's it's important that if you're in business, in commercial business or industrial business, that you make money. So, I mean, the passport to say is, if you allow me to do this, I can make you more money, right? Or I can reduce risk. And that's the introduction. That's how you begin to get recognized, is you're making a contribution relative to the goals of the company, the objectives of the company. You can tie that back in there and say, look, you've got all these objectives up here. And I'm going to make a contribution to one of these. So here it is. And therefore, there's a responsibility to listen. But you know, but you really need to spend a lot of time making sure the strategy, your strategy of how you're going to sell yourself or sell your belief is well thought through. And always think about what is going to be the rebuttal. Because the last thing you want to do is not have an answer to the challenge that will come when you start being either critical because you may have to go in and say, I think you're doing this all wrong, as I did. <laughs> then somebody's going to say, you might not have the center person standing up and saying, listen to the kid. You may say, wait a minute, that's not in your field, don't bother. So, and then you go back and say, well, you know, being a member of this company, I, can, I believe I can make a contribution. And your interest is making money. So you need to make sure that you're ready for the answer to the question that might not be there. OK, let me ask you a follow-up question to this. Okay. Uh, obviously, you hire a lot of people and have over the years. What skill do you find is most efficient in the resumes and the interviews that you, uh, well, you meet? <laughs> <laughs> where, where are people weakest? Well, um, in the, uh, well, I think that um, you've, got, you've got to put yourself sort of into a box a little bit but because we do hire a lot of engineers, and engineers are inclined to be a little bit anal. And, um, yes. <laughs> and, uh, Lacks a ability to communicate. I mean, okay. communication is more than that. Alvin, don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Alvin's one of the engineers. <laughs> okay, Present sorry. company, not Present company experience. Uh, but, um, uh, but the key is here is that you know, our, our approach is different because what we do is we recognize that we need talent in a certain area, which is high end engineering talent. That's very important. For and we recognize right away that it might not hold the, the, the skills that we need. And I, I'll give you an example. Um, that you go through an education at UBC and you come out as a civil engineer and you play with all these computer models and you get everything else. And so when a, when a new young engineer comes in and gets a challenge and they say, okay, what are you going to do? Tell them what you want to do. And they say, okay, I'll go. I say, before you go out the door, here's a pencil and paper. Go and figure it out. And they look at you rather strange. You know, what do you have some paper? I get all these computer tools. No, because when you start using a pencil and paper, your mind thinks in a different space. Because I can't press the button now and get something exactly at the 12 decimal places. What I've got to go is I've got to go and develop a concept. I've got to go out and I think about, well, where can I buy this thing off the shelf? How can I clip this all together? How can, you know, how can I, I'm not going to sit here for you know for 20 weeks trying to figure out a solution. I need to bring ideas and concepts that are simple and straightforward. And surprising enough, when this happens and they go through and they work all the numbers out, they come back and say, "Well, I think it's you know 2.5." I said, "Well, go on and figure it out in the machine." Time. They come back, "Well, it was 2.857329." Now, what's the difference? Because what you need to do is you need to understand what is important. What is important? I don't need answers to 12 decimal places because all I can build something is to one. So you've got to get scale. You've got to get balanced to make sure that the effort that you're putting in is directly related to the end result. And the bottom line, again, is the end result is to find solutions that are cost effective. And no matter what you do. So it's the, all I'm trying to instill is this thought process to be creative in how you deal with your boss, creative in how you deal with your particular problem and making sure that you provide value, and then you're halfway there.
Same question you guys. What, what skills do you think are most deficient in the applications that you see? Maybe home? Deficiencies. Deficiencies, yeah. Where are people weakest? Where do you think people need to focus their energies? And I do see that in some of the, some of, some of the younger ones. And granted, I think hiring is actually hard. Mm -hmm. right. You really get people like, they, they get, have a great interview, you bring them in, you're like, you know, it's their person. So. <laughs> <laughs> Self-awareness and a willingness to take some risks in their relationships, sort of a willingness to approach people, a willingness to 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 to, to, to contribute, and as opposed to, and we get sometimes I see this happening, a little bit of a sense of entitlement. It feels like um, there's been um, a sense of did really well in university, did did really well, really great book, book skills, but not necessarily great. And not communication skills where you can write an email, like an 18-page email. Like, sort of the, the really, those intricate skills of like understanding people, understanding your audience when you're talking to them. It's that kind of stuff, that juicy stuff that I wish you could see more of. And I know that comes from experience and it comes from life, but it comes down to kind of like a lot of more self-awareness. Um, there's a term that I actually, in this course, when I took the program management full-time intensive, I think it goes down, I got, told us by somebody, maybe it was Teresa, I'm not even sure, but um, it was, uh, um, you get hired because of your hard skills and you get fired because of your soft skills. Right? And so I think it's really true. Like you yep. can get a job, uh, what I find when I, when I find people um, in whatever company I've ever worked at, it's that soft skill of creating relationships, um, asking questions, being vulnerable to ask those questions, and learning, and building on your, building up your skill set. And, Understanding the culture, understanding the processes, understanding the so much is just by creating those relationships because those relationships will be tested throughout that employment, throughout your employment at that company. And by having strong relationships helps people rally around to, to create uh, that team and create the build over the result that's expected. So let me open this up to the audience then. What questions do you have? What challenges are you facing in your careers? Uh, and what questions would you like to ask? Somebody's going to have to go for it. <laughs> so. um, do you think it's possible to change culture if they don't have a project management sort of, um, if they, you know, if they don't value project management as much, shall we say? So is the issue that, right, so there's, there's not a value of project management and you see a need? Yeah, like it's not seen as a, a valuable, I don't want to say extreme, like valuable skill, but it's not as high as some of the other skills in that So there's the question about can you change that culture? Yeah. Can you, do you think you can? And how? That's the question. I think a one thing you've got to be careful with is that there's a fear, maybe, on the main project manager. Right? So then you need to figure out, well, how do I get where I want to be by instilling some confidence that needs some leadership or some mentoring or some other vehicle that gets you where you need to be. So uh, you do that by example. And, and I think that's possibly the way you get. Because you know that if you go to in a small company and you go and, and it's growing and you suggest you need a project manager, then they say that's going to cost me money. Right? So you don't want to go there. So what you need to do is, I think, is that depending on whatever job you're doing, is then if you want to migrate into that, then you have to find the vehicle to do that. And then you've got to bring value because, as I said, everybody is in business to either grow or do better or do whatever. So you find that niche that will attract interest and then you use that as a vehicle to get and eventually they say, well, you know, what I've done here now over the last six months is actually labeled maybe project management. So if you think that's got value, and maybe you should think about promoting me to be a project manager. And I think it's about finding allies, too, yeah. right within that. And you figure out your intention, and you can build it up, but you need to share what you want. Not, not doing it all by yourself. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is this one, uh, and I can't remember exactly, Gaultier or something like that, who says, you know, that the, the 
the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. Now, project management is about organizational skills. Okay? And the core value, I think, that you need to base the culture around is being organized. And if you tolerate people not being organized, and you turn a blind eye to that, and you let it go, you are creating that environment. You are creating that culture. And so although this isn't always practical, and you've got to be careful not to become a micromanager, what we have to start to clamp down on is where people clearly aren't being organized, and you call them out on it. Because if you don't call them out on it, you've created a norm, which is anti what you're trying to create. Yeah, so the last thing I'm going to ask is I've seen that culture is difficult. And the smaller you are, the easier it is to some degree. Um, but some of the startups I've worked in, um, you know, we have a, a couple of quick wins and all of a sudden the culture changes. You know, success breeds more success and changes culture very positively. Um, and I think it's just a matter of maybe focusing in on those, because it comes from the grassroots, right? It's where early culture really gets embedded and starts building up. The, the, you know, the executives can try to force culture, but in the end, in the end it belongs to the employees, right? And so it's a matter of finding those quick wins across the organization and uh, trying to, you know, try to um, change the culture in that way to something that you want to form to. A good leader acquires the position by respect. And that's important to understand. I mean, you just, you, you grow into your position. But what you need to do is you need to have a team around you say, yeah, okay, I, I support you. You're right. And you know, that's, a, that's a very good base to begin to grow your confidence is that if you are working with a team is to say is to talk to the team and say, I think we should maybe suggest collectively or what do you think about this idea? And then they say, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And then at least you've got some support. You're not out there on your own. And I think that's important. So communication is the key. You know, and that's and, and being able to be sensitive to the feedback and how do you wiggle your way through the forest. What other questions do we have? Yes. Um, very directed question. Um, <coughs> after a person completes this uh, continuous studies certificate, mm -hmm. is that do you feel like that do you find that that's enough to get someone into the project and field, or is it after getting the PMP? Well, probably in this room we have people who can answer that, right? Uh, how many of you have done the UBC certificate programs, either online or in person? <laughs> okay, so quite a lot of you. How many of you have got jobs afterwards in project management roles or something where you drew upon those project management skills? So, quite a number. I, I think it is feasible. Uh, I think it does depend on, on your level of experience and background. Um, and so, uh, and your ability to deliver value, uh, as David's point here, right? I mean, projects are about creating value, and you've got to be able to see value, convince people, and deliver value. And so a certificate program like this, I think, gives a lot of solid background and a, a good, solid sort of foundational knowledge. But you've got to go beyond that in today's marketplace, right? You've got to show people you can actually do stuff, right? Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, problems in finding jobs in Vancouver yeah. and different cities in the world, how they reflect that. Um, just wondering about, um, what sectors those are in that you're referring to, and what sectors you may guide some of us unsure people about of where to maybe concentrate our efforts. Um, which sectors or which cities? Sectors, yeah. <laughs> cities we can find. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously here in, in Vancouver, uh, we have limited selection, I would say, right? Uh, I don't know, what, what's the hot job market at the moment? Any, anyone know? Development. Development? Oh, yeah. So software development, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so software is still pretty hot. Um, so yeah, developing some with skills with agile energy. development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care what sector, anything that has a language of some, some language of technology. I don't, I think it doesn't matter what sector. Yeah. Uh, having said that, I mean, morally, Silver um, mentioned to me he often consults in the oil business, and right now that's flat. Mm -hmm. so it's also yeah. flat in Texas, by the way, so that should make us feel better. Um, but it's cyclical. If you 
you have a certain number of decades, you kind of see things go up and down. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's um, yeah. Vancouver's not head office like Toronto. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. It's not head office for consumer goods or insurance companies, but it's head office for other things. I'm going to pick up on something Sam said earlier here about opportunity. Opportunity is all around us. Mm -hmm. okay, even here in Vancouver, I honestly honestly believe there is opportunity everywhere. And it's a matter of tuning yourself into that and being prepared for it. And how do you become prepared for it? I mean, Sam. Um, all I can actually go back to when I first moved to Vancouver, 1999. Um, I was in the film and TV industry. It's a very competitive, obviously, industry. And all of I just kept going back to one place that I had a little nip, a little nugget, a little sniff at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just kept going back there, and they just kind of got used to me being there, and then I got in, uh, they hired me, right? So it's... You know, ground them down. Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's determination, it's persistence. Yeah. Um, it's knowing what you want and going for it, um, and knowing where you want to be in the, in the, in the short term and the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what I think. Point. So you actually have a plan. I, I agree, yeah. And I think opportunity is out there. It, it's not at home, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I honestly believe this. I think you've got to hit the road, right? You've got to go talk to people. You've got to, you know, um, interact with people. And, and the more comfortable you become at doing that, and the more you do it, the more the opportunities start to appear. There's opportunities in this room right now, probably, to network. Right? Yeah, I think it, there's, the more you challenge yourself and take risks, and yeah. yourself in situations where you might be Yeah, it is very tempting to sit in our comfort zones, right? How many of you are in your comfort zone in your current job? It's quite a lot of you. Okay. Uh, it is very tempting uh, to sit in the comfort zone, right? And I think today's job market is not very tolerant of that. Um, I think it's, it's uh, no offense to those guys. But I think it's, it's risky, right? Because, you know, the job is there today, but you never know tomorrow whether it will still be there. And I'll you be one of the lucky ones. I'd like to back that up real quick because um, in the mid 2000s I was very comfortable and complacent at ESPs. Um, I was working on R&D. I was making a lot of progress. I was I launched uh, three new games for EA and created for value. And still, when the recession hit, I found myself out of a job because R&D is one of the first things that's cut when when the time. So um, regardless of how much value you can still present to a company, you you always got it. That complacency led to me being a little bit. Um, not learning enough, as I now I continuously learn. As I said before, I take a course every year, whether it's professional development, whether it's a cooking cooking class, whatever it is, just find passion and just continue to follow it. Um, and but always continuous learning is so key in today's job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're kind of reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have to. I, I think yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it, right? You have to be reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. There is no stability unless you're one of the lucky few. I mean, you never say never, but for most people, um, career changing is becoming the norm, right? Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm not sure for Heidi specifically. Um, so as a woman in a directorial position, how do you make sure that your voice is heard when you're probably often in a situation where it's you and a lot of old white men? <laughs> <laughs> Because my role is sort of a, a middle manager. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a president, I'm a director, and I do manage a department. And it's, a, it's, it's functional, so we work in teams all the time. So I act as a producer and I, I manage a team. And I understand what you're saying in terms of the, the um, your voice being heard. Because it's often coming from such a different place, Right. I mean, <laughs> the organization I work for it, it is fairly dynamic, and there's like and there's like a lot of um, a lot of powerful women that do work there. Um, but you pick and choose your battles, and it depends on what I want. And if it's something that's really important to me, and I know I need to make a change or suggest something, I don't hesitate. So it's really the relationships that you have there. So I have really good relationships with the partners in the agency, and I have good relationships with you know, the senior management, my boss. So I think if those relationships are there first, there's going to be more of an ability or a way 
too happy to be heard, right? There's a level of confidence and respect mm -hmm. that I experience at my job. It's easier um, I'll give you an example to bring out that additional stuff. Um, we did um, a project for Disney called Soaring Over California. And it was a complex project. You know, and Disney came with the ideas. So and there were a team that were on from Disney. Disney are very difficult to deal with. They're prima donnas, they believe in everything. <laughs> Really difficult to do. So, and we used to have really great battles for them. I mean, good battles, but battles. And then we decided to put a project engineer in charge who was also a project engineer who was, who was a lady. And we went down to the first meeting, there was absolute silence. She got everything she wanted. <laughs> so, did she do it? Well, she did. Well, they respected it. They respected it, but they respected her ability because she had a way of being able to communicate, a very good way of communicating, and anything that was, we, and we, we set, I would say we set her up, but what we did is we made sure that when we went into the meeting, she had the right answers to the questions that we were going to have. And, and, and it was a way of managing the meeting, the way she did. She listened to the questions, and she stopped, said nothing, and then came back with the answer. So there was, there was a subtle gap between on the communication, which is extremely important, is how do you communicate effectively? And you take your time. You must listen, understand the question, formulate your answer in style that is going to be acceptable and deliver. And she had that skill that got her respect. So what happened, the next project that we got, they said, we would like William to work on that project. So there's huge value if you play the game right. Yes, I think it was Teresa, it was Teresa, but we were talking about political astuteness. So being aware of politics, because we don't think, we think of ourselves as like, oh, I'm not going to be political, I don't want to be political. But we need to know what the relationships are, and you need to be astute of what the relationships are. Teresa, do you want to comment on that? One, 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 one more thing on that, which is important in terms of the sort of sitting in an environment, communication environment. What you want to do is you want to know who your friends are on the other side of the table. Right? And when you and if you find an ally on the other side of the table in a conflict with top line or her, because they're going to be in this. So it's setting up that interaction is it really important. You've got to know the battle. You've got to know how to play the battle. Okay, well, I think I'm we have... the bell. Okay, we'll take one more call. question. <coughs> and I think Teresa was going to say something. Well, just to the response about gender, you know, I mean, I've had a long career. <laughs> and honestly, for me, I don't think gender was ever an issue for me. Um, I think, you know, the relationship piece is huge. You know, you build your coalitions, you know who holds the power, you network, you go have coffee or have a conversation with somebody and share what you know and and I don't think that matters what gender you are I think in order to move things forward you need to know where those yeah. things are and um, I actually never thought about it you know about my gender my whole career um, it just happened that I was female so you know that's because you are you yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I just yeah, yeah. I never really thought about it Although my the one thing I did do that was different was because I was a female in a leadership positions and I had children, um, I never golfed because I didn't have four hours. So um, I did something different. You know, I would say, do you want to go for lunch or can I buy you dinner or something? I, I never golfed because I could not give four hours to networking. That was my only thing. And my father, who was an executive, was hugely disappointed in me. <laughs> Do I have time for one more? Okay, one more. Okay, we'll take one more. Uh, 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 any volunteers it. request for it? Yeah. No? Who gets the last okay. question? That's it? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I think I, I had one question. Uh, it's about. Um, I wanted to know. Okay, you, you talked about uh, communication, like it was one of the best to be uh, a effective project manager. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't you think that uh, if you are also subject, uh, subject matter expert, mm -hmm. it will 
it, it would be an advantage, especially if when you were working on the on the telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, business. that's all part of the formula. Um, you know, you've got to start off on the bottom run, and eventually you, you get <coughs> the knowledge, and you leave that knowledge, and you eventually climb up the run with the ladder. So, so uh, it's 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 you know the, the most important thing is always being curious. You, you've always got to be looking for answers. You may not have all you know. You, you don't expect that you've got all the answers, right? no matter what you do. So what you've got to do is you've got to build a system where you know where to find the answers, or who you know who to go and get the answers from. And you communicate that, and then you build up your knowledge, and you thus build up strength, and you build up knowledge. So, I mean, I, when I started off on the telescopes, I knew nothing about it. I, 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 knew, I didn't even know what I said to binoculars were. <laughs> but what, what you do over time is that you begin to talk to people, and then what happens is that you have something that you can sell. I remember very clearly going when we were working on a, a, a telescope down in, in Texas, and going to the university and, and talking to the professors there, and they were experts in their field, but they had no idea how to build a telescope. Right? So now what you do is you begin to you.